Our bishops in the Holy Synods concern themselves with trivial issues, such as should we celebrate the changing of gender? We have to have something more ambitious, like creating Christian states in the Middle East and independent countries for Christians where Christians have no safe haven at all. The point of the devil, the, the, the way that the devil works, the way that Satan works, is he wants you to agree with a lie that he whispers in your ear. The very person that all Christians look back to as the first leader of the church denied Jesus. But Christ took him back. Are you ready to make that decision today? So I want to talk about um, what are the real problems being faced by the church because right now what we see because of the pressures of liberal society there are voices within the Christian church that are seeking to dominate the church the, the debate within the congregation of the faith about issues connected to liberalism so we see for instance the synods of the church been occupied by non-issues such as gay marriage or baptisms for transvestites to celebrate their becoming uh, a new gender. We see uh, the kind of debates within the church that are really non-issues about whether you receive the communion in the hand or in the mouth when really the kind of issues that the church needs to be talking about are really the following. One, how can Christians best work together to advance the faith? Because right now we are in a situation where Christian congregations are divided by denominationalism and sectarianism, which means that they are wasting resources, time and energy fighting one another or replicating the same costs while carrying out the same initiatives, making the, the, the Christian witness far less effective. That sectarianism has prevented us from presenting a united Christian front against all of the opponents of the church. That's a real issue. How as Christians can we work together so that we present a united Christian front against the enemies of the church? And those enemies are things like the liberal humanists, the liberal secularists, the communists, the ethno-nationalists. It is groups like the Islamists, the Taoists. It is those groups that seek to replace the Christian faith with something else, whether it be a political ideology or another religion. A real issue that the church should be talking about is about the fact that there is a crisis of families within the church. The church has lost the art of creating families. The church has lost the art of creating marriages that go on to produce children. Too many of our brethren end up their entire life as single. Too many of our sistren, because of the lack of masculinity within the church, end up having to marry non-believers. And too many of our families end in divorce. Now, these are all symptoms of a much wider social construct, the much wider fruits of a liberal, capitalistic, consumerist society that seeks to atomize us so that we can be individual consumers. But the problem is that the church, rather than creating those structures that allow families to form, has abandoned that whole area of life, does some teaching on it in principle, and then allows the believers to go into the world to find their own families using the models presented to them by liberal society. And a much better way 
would be to go back to that tradition of the arranged marriage. Now, not so much being driven by the family, but being driven by the church itself. Brothers and sisters working together to help brothers and sisters get married. Christians need to rediscover what it is to create families and to support families. Because as anyone will tell you, who's looked into the research by the Pew Foundation, the thing that drives religious growth the most is not conversion, but procreation. The reason why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world today, after atheism, which is actually the fastest growing philosophy in the world today, is because of birth rates. It's not because of the number of converts, though of course they are making converts as well but so is the church. What's really happening is the fact that Christians have failed to create structures within our communities that produce families. And one of the principal reasons for that is because every pastor, every leader, wants to keep their congregation to themselves and doesn't want the wider Christian community to mix as a people. That's a real challenge that the church faces. None of these non-issues that the synods are currently debating. Another issue that the church needs to get to grips with is the persecution of our own community. The persecution of our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. The persecution of our brothers and sisters in Egypt. The persecution of our brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq. The persecution of our brothers and sisters in Pakistan of our brothers and sisters in North Korea, of our brothers and sisters in China, of our brothers and sisters in Burma. Christians are being persecuted. And like sheep without a shepherd, we are looking to the nation liberal states to come to our rescue. And they won't. They never will. They haven't. They haven't since the time of the Crimean War and they're not going to in the future. Christians must find their own solutions to this problem emanating from within our own community by mobilizing and creating those structures that best aid the persecuted church in their plight and to work to an agenda that is more ambitious than simply giving Christians moral support, emotional support, and a little bit of money with the Bible. We have to have something more ambitious, like creating Christian states in the Middle East and independent countries for Christians where Christians have no safe haven at all. We have to be more ambitious and we have to create those structures that will allow those more ambitious goals to be realized. That requires a more muscular faith, a more dynamic faith, a faith quite different to do the institutional Christian civic religion that many Christians experience in their churches today. Another real issue that Christians face is the fact that as Christians, we aren't doing evangelism. There are too many fellowships, Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Orthodox, where those fellowships gather together on a Sunday and then do no evangelism for the next seven days at all. And they don't even do any on a Sunday. How can we bemoan the fact that people are not coming to Christ if we do not share Christ in a convincing way? We have evacuated this need for evangelism to those eccentrics within our own community who, because of their own issues, stand on street corners screaming at people, thinking that they're making a difference. We need to professionalize our evangelism. We need to engage with wider society in debate, offering confidently a Christian worldview in a Christian way of life as an alternative to the surrounding culture. And that has to be done by having a hard religion of difference, 
by having a sense of our own boundaries, a sense of our own history as a Christian people with Christian values and the structures to make those Christian values lived. It has to be a more insular Christian faith, one that is confident in who it is but also open to the seeker and also seeking to save the lost. We must learn apologetics from the pulpit. We must learn polemics from the pulpit. We must learn to engage with wider society more robustly and defend the interests of our own community in every way that they need to be defended. These are the real challenges that the church faces or some of them, some of the bigger ones. But what instead do our bishops concern themselves with? They concern themselves with assuaging the wider liberal elites and society who will never ever be satisfied with the Christian faith until it looks nothing like the Christian faith. So instead of dealing with the real issues the church faces, its poor use of resources, its sectarianism, its lack of families and its lack of ability to create families, its lack of ability to defend its own and its lack of ability to evangelize, our bishops in the Holy Synods concern themselves with trivial issues, non-issues, questions that have never been heard in the church before, such as, should we have women priests and bishops? Should we have, um, uh, a, a multi-faith uh, relationship where we all worship the same God, such as should we celebrate the changing of gender through <laughs> baptism? This is the kind of nonsense our so-called leaders are concerning themselves with. Or like parochial, timid, sheepish leaders they try to insulate their congregations in a way that has no real engagement with the outside world. When really what we need to be striking is a middle ground between having a strong sense of our own identity and having the ability to share that identity with others and to invite other people to embrace it for themselves. And how we do that is what the bishop should really be concerning themselves about not simply pandering to the whims of a liberal establishment that will always find something to criticize the church for because fundamentally Christianity and liberalism are not the same thing. Any questions? Yes, please. I'd like to ask you a question, but it's not on this one. Okay. The question is, and it's not meant to be rhetorical or insulting, I would like to know, and I've had discussions with you before, and you've been very helpful in enlightening me. It's a basic thing. Is God all-knowing? Yes. Good Outside of the incarnation. Thing I'll is. give you a specific so you actually understand what I'm talking about. The question about whether God is all-knowing is based on the book of Job. Yeah. Chapter 1. And it says, uh, chapter 1, to 6 to 22, verses 6 to 22. Yeah. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And my question is, when Satan appeared yes. with the sons of God, yep. why did God have to ask Satan, from where have you come? God would already okay, know. Okay, so let me, let me address that question. Firstly, we have to understand the literature of the book of Job as it should be correctly understood. The, the book of Job isn't meant to be a literal textbook of history. It is a, a form of wisdom literature. <laughs> It is a form of wisdom literature in which truths are being communicated by the prophetic spirit, by the Holy Spirit, through the writers, in the character of Job and his colleagues. Now whether Job really lived and whether there is a historical person of Job, I am not sure. I'm open to the possibility that there was, and I'm also open to the possibility that the whole book of Job was simply a giant parable of wisdom literature. I in invented characters who are portraying certain truths for us the readers to know. So 
When? Then let's just pretend that Job is a historical character. When uh, Job is reciting this, when when this, because this is all coming from Job's lips, from Job's perspective, Satan is having this conversation with with God. It is about what God is revealing about Satan to us, the audience, which is that the devil roams the earth like a roaring lion seeking the ruin of souls. And that is what the devil is. He is a demonic spirit that prowls the earth seeking to gain our agreement with his lies and in so doing ruin our soul, ruin our hope of salvation. And what are the lies of the devil? The lie of the devil is that Christ was never crucified, only in appearance was made to appear to be crucified. What are the lies of the devil? The lies of the devil was that Jesus is not the divine Logos become a man, but simply a prophet. What are the lies of the devil? The lies of the devil are that Jesus is not the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. What are the lies of the devil? The lies of the devil are that God does not exist, that evolution explains God away or that science removes our need for God. The devil said that. That is a lie of the devil. But the best lie of the devil at all, the best, his masterstroke, is that he himself does not exist. That is by far the best lie. Because if he can get you to agree that he does not exist, then you're not on your guard against those dynamic forces that seek to lead you astray. But, but in that passage, I'm curious, the other thing I was going to ask, when Satan came amongst the sons of God and yes. God, why didn't the Lord cast him away or destroy him? Okay. Why did the Lord have a conversation with him? Yeah, that's a very good question. And then he just went away to Satan, just walked away untouched. Yep. Why was that? I don't so, so as Christians, you've got to understand as Christians how we approach this whole narrative. Okay, because this is a particular snapshot of, of something that lays within a much bigger worldview. So I have to take you right back to the beginning. In the book of Genesis, man was made in the image of God and in the likeness of God thereof he was made. And the point of, of, of the, the Christian understanding of morality and of the human journey is that we grow into the likeness of God through making moral choices. But for there to be moral choices, there has to be real moral choices towards good and towards evil. And thus, there is a agent of evil, an advocate of evil, that within that moral paradigm speaks against natural law, speaks against God's revelation, speaks in a way an advocate of that evil so that man might face that real choice. So what God created that advocate deliberately? The devil was created as an angel of light, but the angels within the Christian worldview also have moral responsibility, though possibly for different reasons. So the angels were also created as free as me and you. The angels were created free? Free minded. I just thought they just took orders from the Lord. No, no, they're created as free agents. Every time you see an angel doing the will of the Lord, it's because he chooses to do so. So is that why they can come down to earth and mate with the sons of men? The, 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 the devil, Satan, yeah, who was formerly known as Lucifer, yeah. became becomes the devil because he becomes the accuser. He becomes one who seeks to accuse man against man and man before God. And he seeks to mislead man. But he became that through his own volition, through his own choice. I don't disagree with that. But it still doesn't answer why God didn't destroy him when he came to the sons of God. Was there a reason why God decided to let him go away and harass Job? Yes. Why? Because in, 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 terms of, in terms of this harassment of Job, it was to demonstrate that Job would be faithful to God. Because the devil, it was a test. And to, to demonstrate to the devil, to demonstrate to the devil that, that those that have faith in God will have faith in God at the cost of anything else. And that is the wisdom of the book of Job. Because we're coming to the wisdom, we're talking about Job, so now let's talk about the wisdom of the book of Job. The wisdom of the book of Job is that no, that we are not to place our identity in anything but the truth of God. 
and by placing our identity in the truth of God, no matter what else it costs us, no matter what else is stripped away, even if our family and all our riches and all our health is taken from us, we must still base ourselves on the truth of God. And that truth is speaking truth about God. Because Job said that God has treated him unfairly. And all of the people around Job said, no, all of this punishments have fallen upon you because of something that you did. But at the end of the book of Job, God says that Job has spoken correctly and all of you, his companions, have spoken in error. So we must speak truthfully about God and we must build ourselves on that truth, our identity on that truth, no matter what it costs. And it is that, that's one of the reasons actually why I am open to the idea that the book of Job is actually just a parable and not a real story in history. Because I understand that now, what you're saying with the test, it makes a lot of sense. The only thing is, so did God liaise with Satan to implement the test? God gave him license. He didn't say to him, oh, right, okay. now I want you to do this and now I want you to do that. He said to him, I remove my protection from Job. He's yours. But, but there was a limit though. What he yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. A, there was a limit. Yeah. So, so, and, and this, is, this is what we Christians believe, because we Christians believe that where we see the deception or the devil working, it is simply because that is the remit, the frontier that God has given the devil. The, God, the devil can't harm you unless you agree with him, unless you agree with his lies. The, the point of the devil, the, the, the way that the devil works, the way that Satan works, is he wants you to agree with a lie that he whispers in your ear. He wants you to believe that lie that says, you don't love your wife like you used to. This girl is so much more attractive and she's into you. He wants you to believe that lie that says, I don't, I, I'm not happy with what I've got. I need more to be happy. He wants you to believe that lie that says, that these Christians, they're all wackos. They, they, they're all wasting their time and their life and their energy. He wants you to believe that lie that says that the richest life, the best life, <laughs> is a life that is filled with lots of diverse experiences and that has comfort and wealth. That, these are the lies of the devil. So from understanding it's either a parable or when God asks Satan, where have you come from? God already knew and was playing into yes. Many, 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 there are many places in scripture where God asks or does things rhetorically. All right. Because oh, he does that with Adam and Eve when they ate Yes, the he said, where are you? Why did you hide from me? Well, these are all questions that God surely knew. But he answered them because God often tests the mind to reveal the heart of man. But there's a problem with that. Though. What, that God tests the, no, no. the mind to reveal the heart no, of man? No, the example let me, let me, let me just, let me just, let me just finish, let me just finish. God, God tests the mind to reveal the heart of man. But reveal the heart of man to who? Because God already knows. So who is he revealing the heart to? He's revealing the heart to yourself. Because there is nothing more deceptive than the human heart. Nothing will lie to you more than your own heart. Because the human condition is bent towards sin, it's bent towards itself. And God tests your mind to reveal your heart to you. So that by knowing the truth, the truth can set you free. So go on. No, it was, it was interesting because I was going to give the other example with uh, Cain and Abel. When Cain murdered his brother Abel and God kept asking him where is Abel, it was a rhetorical question. It was a rhetorical question. Yeah. But uh, I guess with Satan it's different. It wasn't, was it rhetorical with Satan? We already knew what, what Satan was doing. Satan isn't all-knowing. He knows a lot, but he's not all-knowing. He's not he can't be everywhere at the same time. He can't be everywhere at the same time. Yeah. Oh, he has to go to and fro. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he has to go to and fro. So it's revealing truth about the devil. It's saying that the devil isn't all powerful, that he isn't everywhere. No, but when God. That he's limited in time and scope and presence. But when the Lord asked him, the Lord already knew that he was going to say to and fro. So was that supposed to be rhetorical? To say yeah, something? because he, he's draw, he's, he's, what he's doing is conveying truth about the devil. 
and about himself. To who? The, to, to you, the audience. Okay, so it's a story which is supposed to convince you Yes, because what, what you see when you read that passage is you see that the devil isn't all powerful. You see that the devil isn't all knowing. You see that the devil isn't all present. Which means that you can know that there is a limit on the power that the devil can have. Now bear in mind that that is one snapshot in a bigger picture, you know. Are you a Christian or something? I was a Christian for a very long time, then I stopped going to church, stopped going on a pilgrimage, and uh, that was it. Yeah. So I'm thinking about trying to get back, so I read a lot. But um, I have a lot of questions, and when I need them answered, I come members of DCC. By the way, I do like your attitude, though. It's really, really refreshing to see that. Yeah. I mean, in, in, I mean you've, you've answered a question for me before. So go for this film. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would encourage you, brother. Do you have a, um, uh, the Gospels? Do you? Yeah. Like, I would encourage you, literally, sit down and read them, write down your questions, and then if you want, come and grab me. And we'll, we'll go have a cup of tea, we'll go and talk through them all. Because I, let me encourage you. Right? A lot of the questions that we throw at the Christian faith, yeah, they're all genuine for most of us, except for the Dawah team. But, but <laughs> they, they, a lot of them are used simply as an excuse to hold us back from fully engaging with the gravity of the truth that Christ is God made man that he died and that he rose again, and that he did so by establishing God's kingdom on earth, and that we are called to work for that kingdom. And, and, and let me encourage you, there hasn't been a question that I personally have encountered that have caused me any difficulty in the faith. You know, and I would say that you have nothing to fear in terms of intellectual scruples, in terms of consistency, in, in embracing the Christian faith as a coherent worldview. What I suspect probably holds you back is the, the thing that holds most people back, which is what is the cost? What is the cost of following as a disciple of Christ? And I can't, I can't, I can't lie about that. The cost is heavy. The cost is nothing less than dying to yourself and being born again. And the cost is nothing less than, than giving everything to Christ as his disciple. Every ambition, every hope, every emotion, every thought, every resource, every desire. It's a heavy cost. But to it comes that opportunity to be part of God's ability to make creation new and to, to enter into the completion of that new kingdom when Christ comes again and to experience all the joys of heaven. I would also leave you with this. Saint Peter himself, the apostle upon which Christ founded the church, denied Christ three times. The night before he was crucified, Peter, the very person that all Christians look back to as the first leader of the church, denied Jesus. But Christ took him back. It doesn't matter that you have denied Christ. Christ will take you back if you can only surrender your heart to his love, to his lordship, to his rule. Are you ready to make that decision today? Not yet. Not yet. Then in but, that but, case... But it's not, it's not never say never. Never, no, exactly. So when you've got more questions, come back, we'll talk some more. Thanks. And I look forward to the day that you proclaim Christ as Lord with me. God bless. <laughs>